Okay, good morning, friends. Welcome to the bridge. <laughs> just before I start to speak, um, I just had an email from Evan and Lynette Dollar, uh, who come to us in the mornings. Uh, Lynette has been diagnosed with cancer, and she's having an operation next week, so just asked if we could pray for Lynette and for Evan. So, Lord, we do thank you for Evan and Lynette. Thank you for their faith. Thank you that they've been baptized here in the name of Jesus. We just commit them into your care now, and we do pray for your hand of healing upon Lynette. Pray that you stretch forth your hand to heal her, and that you'd raise her up from this cancer. Pray that the operation will go well, and that you'll care for her, and just commit her into your care now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to speak today from 2 Peter chapter 1, so if you want to turn to that in the Bible, we'll also be putting it up on the screen here. Um, last week I spoke on Psalm 11 and the question, if the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do, was my theme. So if you see the foundations of your society being destroyed, you see the foundations of faith in the church being destroyed, what are you going to do? That's the question which the psalm asks and uh, I suggested a few things which we can do in response to that last week, that one, we can build our lives on the rock of faith, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, so when the storm comes and the floods come, the house will stand and won't fall down. If you build it on the sand, it will fall down, so build it on the rock of faith. I also said that the church itself should be built on faith, and I think uh, Philip actually just quoted the verse about Jesus saying, I'll build my church, and on this rock, uh, and the rock, I said, was not actually Peter himself, it was Peter's confession of faith, Jesus, that you are the Son of God, the Messiah, the Holy One of Israel. And also the uh, last thing I said was to preach the gospel according to Matthew chapter 28, to go into all the world and share the good news of Jesus with the world around us. And I'm going to read a passage from 2 Peter. Um, I did actually read this last Sunday evening as well, so if people here in the evening, I'm afraid you will get some of the same, but uh, it follows on from what I was saying. But we're going to read from 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 12, and through to chapter 2, verse 2. So this is the word of God. Let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is the truth. Pray, Lord, that you bless the reading of your word. Do pray also, as we thought about Lynette again, pray that you'll stretch with your hand to heal her. And we pray that you open our eyes to hear your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. So verse 12, for this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. Uh, by the way, putting off his tent, he means dying, basically. Speaking about this tent as a temporary dwelling which he's in, going to put it off, and Peter's announcing that he's shortly going to die. Moreover, I'll be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Peter knew that his time to die was at hand, so he wanted to pass on some information which would be helpful to the believers in Jesus, to make them sure of their salvation, and of the truths which he'd been teaching, which the apostles had been teaching after the time of his departure. Uh, if you look at this passage, you see there were three things which he wanted them to be sure of. Make sure that they're building on this foundation 
three things which God wants us to be sure of as well. Uh, first, that the word of God is trustworthy, was given to us by eyewitnesses, people who actually saw Jesus. Therefore, you can trust in it. There's a prophetic word which is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, something which is uniquely given by God, which confirms to us the truth of the word of God so that we can believe in it. And finally, he says you should recognize and reject false teachers, and the characteristic of false teachers will be that they will deny the Lord who bought you. Uh, Jesus bought us by shedding his blood for us, so they will some way deny the cross that Jesus died for us. So actually, he's affirming here the importance of the cross, that Jesus died for us, that we should believe in him, and through Jesus know that we have been bought with a great price, the blood of Jesus. So let's have a look at those three themes. We're going to look mainly at the first one, actually, the word of God. And the fact that it is an eyewitness testimony. It's actually very important that we believe that this word was given to us by eyewitnesses. Because when we read this word, it tells us about our salvation. It tells us about how Jesus came, how he lived a perfect life, how he died for our sins, how he rose from the dead. And the primary source we have of information for this, of course, is in the Bible. And therefore, God wants you to believe it, and the devil wants you not to believe it. Uh, the devil wants to go around. First, remember that the first thing which the devil said to uh, Adam, or to Eve actually, was, hath God said? So he's going to do what he can to make you question the word of God and question its validity. Uh, and Peter says here that uh, you should have good reasons to believe that this is the word of God. Uh, and he has, one of the reasons he gives to this is because it's been given to you by people who are eyewitnesses, who saw it happen. Uh, he says... Uh, in verse 16, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Fable is a story which someone's made up. And if it's a story which someone's made up, then you don't have to believe it. But if it's an account of what's really happened in time and space, and there are people who've seen it happened, and they've recorded it for us, then you should believe it. Because these are trustworthy men who are telling you the truth, and explaining to you what really happened. And Peter says, gives his credentials, he says, I am a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, also a partaker of the glory which will be revealed. So he's giving his credentials that he was a witness of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And so we have the testimony here that this is a book given to us by eyewitnesses. And you'll find that the enemies of the gospel will do what they can to attack this view. Some of them will come from within the church. And we have one of the problems which we have in Christianity today is a lot of uh, churches were infiltrated by what we call liberal theology, which has done what it can to undermine your faith in the validity of the word of God. One of the things they've undermined is also the fact that this was given to us by eyewitnesses, saying it was written several years later by other people. And in fact, there's a man called Asher Norman who I've written an answer to. He wrote a book called uh, 26 Reasons Why Jews Don't Believe in Jesus. Uh, if you go on my Messiah Factor website, I've given some answers to his 26 reasons. But one of the things he says uh, is that the epistles and gospels were not written by actual witnesses to the events they described. It says the gospels were written by an unknown, unknown men who took their names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John up to 150 years after the events they described. Uh, so, <laughs> written by some people who made up this story 150 years later. Uh, Muslims also changed that the Bible which we have has been changed. Uh, so that we have a book which has been corrupted, they say, and they've got the true version, which is the Quran. Uh, there was also a book which was a bestseller quite recently called The Da Vinci Code by a man called Dan Brown. Anybody read it? <laughs> Don't advise you to read it. <laughs> it's quite a good yarn, actually, the adventure side of it. But what he says about historical is completely untrue. But he says the, product, the Bible is the product of a man not of God. The Bible did not fall magically onto the clouds. Men created it as a historical record of his tumultuous times. It's evolved through countless translations, editions, and revisions. History is never defined, had a definitive version of the book. He says the four Gospels were chosen out of about 80 accounts of Jesus at the time of the Council of Nicaea, 312. And he says this is history. Well, it's not actually, it's bunk. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to tell you why it's bunk in a moment. Now, actually, the dating of the scriptures is quite important. Uh, if they were eyewitnesses, then they saw it happen. If they were later writers, they could have made it up. And it could be untrustworthy. 
If they were later writers, you've got to ask the question, how did they know? Uh, where did they get their facts from? How did they get it all right about geography, history, and the customs of the time, which you have in the, in the New Testament? Didn't have any Google to research information on? Uh, where did they get the information from? If they made it up 150 years later, who would have believed them? I don't think I said that uh, my grandfather was in the First World War, saw somebody who was uh, shot in the trenches, and magically he came back to life and revealed himself to be God. And I said it now. Who would believe me? Nobody. It'd be the story made up. But if somebody made it up, somebody saw it happen, wrote it down and preached it from the beginning, then you could have faith that this was a message which was true. And of course, the message of the gospel was preached beginning on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, after the resurrection of Jesus, and has spread from there. And it was written down in the recent history of the events taking place. And we have something also called apostolic authority testimony. Uh, how did you qualify to be an apostle? Now, we have some people who say they're apostles today. Now, one sense, apostle does mean somebody who's sent. So somebody can say that they're an apostle if they're a missionary or they're sent to plant churches. But an apostle in the sense of being one of the people who had seen Jesus, you can't have any today because only those who were there at the time. Uh, when Judas uh, fell and the book, meaning the book of Acts, they had a decision to try to replace Judas with a 12th apostle. And in Acts chapter 12, 1 verse 21, it says, Therefore, of these men who accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and amongst us, in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So the qualification to be an apostle was that you be a witness of Jesus, his life, his death, and above all, of his resurrection. So that was something which was only available, of course, to people who had been alive at the time. And Peter himself says that he is such an eyewitness. And in this passage which we just read, it says... Uh, we were there to hear the voice of God from heaven and to see the Lord transfigured on the mount. Uh, what was that event which he was referring to? Uh, he was referring to an event which you'll find in Matthew chapter 17, the transfiguration of Jesus. And Peter says, I was there, I saw it. Uh, it's not a story I made up. I was there. In fact, if you read the account, he was there with John and with James. Uh, and three of the disciples saw this happen. Uh, by the time Peter wrote this, in fact, James was already dead because in Acts chapter 12, he'd been put to death by Herod. So uh, Peter and John were the only people left who had actually been eyewitnesses of the transfiguration of Jesus. But this is what, he wrote, this is what Matthew wrote about it. Uh, now, after six days, Jesus took J Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to James, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make th here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright light cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Peter says, I'm an eyewitness. I saw that happen. Uh, I saw Jesus on the mountain. And there's a significance in that event, of course. Uh, when Jesus became man and dwelt amongst us, he laid aside his glory. So uh, he came from heaven where he had all the glory of heaven. And you have a description of Jesus glorified in heaven in Revelation chapter 1 in his tremendous power and glory. But when he came to earth, he laid that aside and he became man. He appeared as a normal human being. He grew up as a baby, from a baby to a young man, to the time when he became the, uh, came out as the Messiah, if you like, at the age of 30, and began his ministry. But as he was going around Nazareth and Jerusalem and all the places he went to, he looked like anybody else. Uh, if he'd looked like he did on the day of transfiguration, uh, walking around Naz Nazareth with his face shining like the sun, been a bit difficult to miss that he was the Messiah, wasn't it? But he says he laid aside his glory in order that he might become the suffering servant and suffer and die for us on the cross. But as he 
on the, on the time of the transfiguration, that was, veil was torn away. And they saw Peter, Peter saw him in his glory, saw him with his face shining like the sun, his, cl his clothes dazzling white as light. And they saw him as he really is. And as they saw him, they were, I guess, pretty overwhelmed by the sight. Uh, Peter didn't really know what to say. He said, let's make a booth for you, a tabernacle for you. One for Moses, one for Elijah. And uh, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son. Listen to him. Believe him. He is the unique one. He is the son of God, also the son of man. And so this story is actually an affirmation uh, of the glory of God and of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ as son of God, son of man. And Peter says he was an eyewitness of this, which gives him authority to write about it. And so if somebody was an eyewitness, they saw it happen, they can say that this is the truth, this really did happen. And God wants us to believe that this really is the truth, that Jesus really is son of God, son of man, the new saviour who died for us and rose from the dead. So moving on, if you look at the uh, Gospels, uh, they were written by eyewitnesses or by people who got their information from eyewitnesses. The idea they were written by 150 years later is nonsense. Uh, the scriptures themselves show us that they were written by those who actually walked and talked with Jesus, Matthew, one of the disciples, John, one of the disciples, uh, Mark, we believe, got his information from Peter, uh, and that's actually affirmed by some of the church's early church writings. And Luke, who actually gives his credentials in the first verses of Luke's Gospel, which he says, "...inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled amongst us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to us." It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So Luke tells you that he, uh, first of all, got his information from people who are eyewitnesses, but he also says that he was there from the beginning. He says that he had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first. Uh, some people say Luke was a kind of late comer who join Paul later on. I think there's evidence actually that Luke was one of the disciples or one of the, not one of the 12, but one of the people who followed Jesus from the very beginning. But he says here that he had understanding of those things and he wrote them down so that you may have certainty, know the certainty of those things in which you're instructed. So again, these things are written down so that you can know the truth and know that they are reliable. Uh, you go to John's gospel, the end of John's gospel, he signs it off as an eyewitness. John chapter 20, verse 30, it says, Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, but believing you may have faith in his, you may have life in his name. Then in John 21, this is the disciple, and he's actually speaking of himself here. You can tell that from the text. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were all written down one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So John is saying here that he was an eyewitness. He saw Jesus. He wrote down the things which he recalled of his time with Jesus, and he's testifying something which he says is true. Also gives this interesting little line. He says, if he, he wrote down everything which Jesus did, all the books in the world wouldn't be able to contain it. So instead of having to carry around this, which is quite a big book, you'd have had to carry around a great library of books. Now, God knew that wouldn't be terribly convenient, so he whittled down some of the things to just the details we have in the Gospels themselves. But they're written by eyewitnesses. That's the important thing. I believe they were written mostly within the time frame before the destruction of the Second Temple, which was in the year 70, so within 20 to 40 years after Jesus came. Um, in fact, uh, there was a famous theologian who was, I think he's died now, but uh, in my youth he was well known as a liberal theologian who didn't really believe the Bible, called John Robinson. 
But he put forward the view in 1976 that the whole of the New Testament was written before AD 70. His reason was that no book of the New Testament describes the fall of the temple in AD 70 as an event that had already occurred. He said, one of the oddest facts about the New Testament is that what on any showing would appear to be the single most datable and climatic event of the period, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, and with it the collapse of institutional Judaism based on the temple is never once mentioned as a past fact, said but prophetically. Another number of other scholars give reason to believe the early dating of the New Testament. It's a book called The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? by F.F. F. Bruce. He gives good reasons to believe in the early dating of the Gospels and their apostolic inspiration and historical accuracy. A man called John Wenham wrote a book called uh, Redating Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he put forward this scheme as the dating for the New Testament. But you see Matthew's Gospel, uh, around 40 AD, Mark around 45, that's 10 to 15 years after Jesus. Uh, Luke about 54 AD. Various epistles written by John, uh, Paul, and the book of Acts around AD 62. In fact, according to my study, you can actually use the book of Acts as a very good way to date the writing of the, Bible, the New Testament. Uh, if you go to the end of the, the beginning of the book of Acts, it begins with a bang with the day of Pentecost and all the miracles. It ends with Paul in Rome awaiting his trial. And it says that Paul was there for two years in living in his own rented house. Now, what's peculiar about the end of the book of Acts? Uh, for about the last five chapters, Paul, uh, Luke has been describing the events which lead up to Paul going to Rome for this trial. But he doesn't say what happened to Paul. Is that a bit odd? Uh, now, we know that Paul had, after this period where he was waiting in, in Rome, Paul had his trial and he was acquitted and he then began to minister for another two or three years before his execution under Nero. So why didn't he write about the trial and Paul being acquitted? Anybody got any ideas? My idea is that that hadn't happened yet. When Luke finished writing the book of Acts, Paul was still in Rome waiting for the trial. If he'd waited another couple of years to write it, he'd have said what happened. If that's the case, the book of Acts tells us that Paul, that Luke wrote his gospel before Acts, uh, which is logical, and it, Luke tells us that others wrote gospels before him. So he put that as Matthew and Mark. So you have the whole of the new Matthew, Mark, Luke, and book of Acts written before around 62 AD. Probably Paul wrote his letters before he died. And Peter wrote his letters before he died. They both died around 65 to 67 AD, which means you dated most of the New Testament before the, the fall of the temple. You see that? Apart from the writings of John. Now, John did live a long time, and it's possible that he wrote his gospel later. Not certain, because actually there is a fragment of John's gospel which has been discovered, which dates to around 60 AD but we don't know that that definitely means that it was written around then. So we have early dating. Now, the early church actually believed this, and let's look at one or two things which early church writers said. Uh, here's a man called Papias, writing about 125. He said, Matthew collected the oracles, or the logia, or sayings of, about Jesus in the Hebrew language, and each one interpreted them as best he could. Um, that actually tells you that there was a tradition that Matthew wrote his gospel originally in Hebrew. Uh, no one's ever found a Hebrew copy of Matthew's gospel. If you do, you've found the biggest treasure trove you could possibly have. But uh, that is written in the early church that he did write it originally in Hebrew, and it was translated into Greek. And certainly the, the, the patterns of writing actually in, in Matthew's gospel do sound, many of them, quite Hebraic. You can put Matthew's gospel very easily back into Hebrew. Um, it's also interesting that uh, one detail I found out Matthew um, according to the Bible was a tax collector as a tax collector he'd been skilled in keeping records and there's evidence that at the time there was a form of uh, speed writing a bit like shorthand 
uh, which he may have used to write down Jesus' words as he was speaking them. And if you look at Matthew's Gospel, it contains the longest passages of Jesus' teaching. Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5 to 7, the parables, chapter 13, second coming teaching, Matthew 24 to 25. So evidence that Matthew wrote his Gospel early, and a lot of people tell you Mark wrote the first one. I believe Matthew wrote the first one, then Mark, then Luke, then uh, John. Uh, church historian called Eusebius. It says, Matthew pu published among the Hebrews a written gospel also in their tongue. Mark also, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, himself handed down to us in writing the things which were preached by Peter and Luke also, who was a follower of Paul, put down in a book the gospel which was preached by him. Then John, the disciple of the Lord, who had even rested on his breast himself, also gave forth the gospel while he was living at Ephesus in Asia. That's the church historian Eusebius. Another early church writer, a man called Iranius, who was the bishop of Lyon, Lyon around 800, 180 AD. He said, for as there are four quarters of the world in which we live and four individual winds, and as the church is dispersed over all the earth, and the gospel is the pillar and base of the church and the breath of life, so it's natural that it should have four pillars breathing immortality from every quarter and kindling the life of men anew. Whence it is manifest that the word has, been, has given us the gospel in fourfold form and held together by one spirit. So he goes on to affirm that the gospels written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were the four gospels which were accepted universally by the church. Uh, not any other gospels which were actually slung out because they were heretical like the gospel of Thomas and all those other ones uh, which are Gnostic gospels which don't speak about the same Jesus. And these are there from the beginning. Also, you've got the fact that in the Gospels you have historical ac accuracy. Uh, the geography, the history, and the customs are all right. Uh, you can go to Jerusalem today. You can go follow the path which Jesus took from the old city of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, down the Kidron Valley, up to Gethsemane, up to Mount of Olives, over to Bethany. All those places are there. They're all in the right place at the right time. Uh, if you're writing something a lot later, you tend to get these little details wrong. In fact, there is a uh, fraudulent gospel called the Gospel of Barnabas, which Muslims are quite fond of because it denies uh, the divinity of Jesus. According to the Gospel of Barnabas, uh, Pontius Pilate was the governor when Jesus was born. Well, Pontius Pilate became the governor in 29 AD when Jesus was already uh, almost beginning his ministry. It also says that Jesus and Mary and the Holy Family uh, sailed into Nazareth in a boat, which is kind of difficult because there's no sea, no river, and no lake at Nazareth. So that's kind of example. You try and write back later, and you get the details wrong. You won't find any details in the New Testament of geography, of history, or of customs, which can be proven to be wrong. Uh, gives you details, like in Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, in the 15th reign year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea and the region of Trachonitis, Licinius tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. All those people were historical figures. You don't know about them. You don't really need to know about them. But they verify the fact that uh, Luke was writing a history which was verifiable, of an event which took place in time and space. And as I said, it'd be very difficult for a later writer to get these details right. Remember, there's no Google, there's no search engines. Uh, if you didn't have the information to hand, you wouldn't be able to make it up and get it right. It had to be written by eyewitnesses. Another point, there's an enormous amount of manuscript evidence which points to the fact of the truth of the New Testament. Uh, Evidence goes way beyond any other document, including the Old Testament, actually. There are more than 5,300 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, over 10,000 Latin Vulgate, and at least 9,300 early versions. We have more than 24,000 manuscript copies of portions of the New Testament in existence today. No other document of antiquity has even begins to approach such numbers and attestation. 
The documents all say the same thing. It's not the case if it's a later story made up. The world's second best documented ancient book is Hola's Iliad, Iliad, which we have 643 manuscripts. Other points. Quotations from the New Testament in early Christian writings are so extensive that it could virtually be reconstructed from the writings without the use of the New Testament manuscripts. There are no less than 32,289 quotations from the New Testament in the works of early Christian writers, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, Tertullian, Hippolytus, and Eusebius. That's from Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Describes Demands of Urgent. If you put all that together, you have to conclude that the New Testament was put together over a period of time, but using documents which were written very shortly after the events took place written by people who are either eyewitnesses or got their information from eyewitnesses. So therefore, what Peter says earlier, this is not a cunningly devised fable, not a made-up story, but it's a record of what really happened. It's the word of God. And if you're going to have your faith challenged, which it will be, you need to understand that this is the truth, that this book which we have here, you can rely on. It's not a made-up story. It's an account of what really happened. If you're interested in what Josh uh, J. Smith is going to say next week, uh, he has done a lot of research to show that exactly the opposite applies to Islam. Uh, Muhammad was supposed to have lived around 632, I think it's 632 AD he died. Uh, there is no evidence of any written book for at least 100 years. What was became the Quran was written down much later. Uh, you have if you know anything about Islam, you may know the story that Muhammad went into a cave in Mecca and he met the angel Gabriel, who, or Jibril, who dictated to him word for word the Quran. And he couldn't read and write, so it was a miracle that he remembered it all and he had this word written to him. And then he went and preached this message in Mecca and they slung him out and he went to Medina. Then he came back and he conquered Mecca and made it the center of uh, Islam. And he put the... Uh, Kaaba stone, which became the place of pilgrimage in Mecca for Muslims. Uh, where do you read about that story? Do you read about it in the Quran? Do you? What do you think? I mean, if Muhammad is a prophet of Islam, you should read that story surely in the Quran. There's not a word about it in the Quran. Zero. But there's only four mentions of Muhammad in the Quran. Uh, the story actually is written down in something called the Sirah, uh, which has been translated into English as The Life of Muhammad by a man called Guillaume, uh, which was written at least 200 years later, probably in either Damascus or Baghdad, uh, 600 years, 600 miles to the north of where it was supposed to have happened. Its description of Mecca is actually wrong. Uh, it says that it has a stream and a mountain which are not there in Mecca. And in fact, there's no evidence of Mecca actually existing as a city at the time when Muhammad was supposed to have lived. So I'll just tell you this to show you that, that this is a story which has been made up. It's a fable. It's not the truth. Uh, Muslims won't appreciate it if you tell them that, but that happens to be the case. And so, coming back to the Bible, we have this word which is a firm, which is true, which we can rely on, was given to us by eyewitnesses. And it tells us about Jesus from beginning to end. First verse of the Bible, uh, this is the uh, genealogy, the historical record, if you like, of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it goes through right to the end of Revelation to tell you about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And it's all written by people who saw him and who believed him and who heard him. And it gives you his message. His message that if you repent and believe the gospel, your sins will be forgiven and you'll have eternal life and you'll know God and be with him forever. And so you can believe that this is the inspired word of God, and it was given uh, through faithful men who wrote it down, but also who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Which brings us on to the next point about the prophetic word. Uh, he says in here, uh, we also have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place till the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, 
Knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation or origin, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So telling you that this book is inspired by the Holy Spirit is not just made up by men. Holy men of God were inspired by write both the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the New Testament, the story of Jesus. Uh, it's the word of prophecy. Now, prophecy does mean things to do with the future, but also prophecy in the strictest biblical sense means that God was speaking to humans through the prophet by the Holy Spirit. So the ministry of the prophet actually was to represent God and speak his word to the people. And you have Old Testament prophets who did just that. And in one sense, Jesus was a prophet. He was more than a prophet, but he was the prophet who declared the word of God to us. He received God's word and he passed it on to his disciples. And the whole of the Bible, in one sense, is prophetic. It's a word of prophecy given to us to explain to us about God from the beginning to the end. Uh, it's also described here as a shining light in the light shining in the dark. And we see that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, contain clear prophecies which were fulfilled by the Messiah, about his birth, his death, his resurrection, also about his second coming. So again, this is quite unique. No one else has fulfilled prophecy written about him in the detail which Jesus has. And it says also that no prophecy is of private interpretation. Uh, that also could be translated, no prophecy is of private origin. So it's not something which you've made up, it's something which God has given to you, and he's given it to you to make it public. And right through the Bible you see that the prophets made their word public so that it could be heard. And Jesus spoke publicly. He died publicly and he rose from the dead publicly. People saw it happen. Uh, so it's not something which is of private interpretation. Going back to Muhammad, Muhammad, Muslims claim that Muhammad got the Quran and the Quran bears witness to Jesus. So it's like a circular thing. Nobody saw it happen. Uh, we've only got Muhammad's word for it or the Muslim's word for it because Muhammad didn't write it down. So you've got no public event which took place. Right through the Bible, it all happened publicly so you could see or hear it. There were many witnesses. In the Bible, we have these many witnesses, which means that you can check up whether it's true or not. And these things are recorded in Scripture. And you have about 300 prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament. So have a look at some of them. I won't read them all, but you can check this out. In fact, I have done a leaflet which uh, gives you the, the prophecies of the Messiah, which is on the uh, Messiah Factor website. Some of the things which are, I say these are not uh, you know, prophecies about that someone to be a good man will come along and do some nice things. They're very specific. It says that the Messiah will be born to a virgin in, in Bethlehem. Micah 7, Micah, Isaiah 7, Matthew, Micah 5, Matthew chapter 1. To have the power to do miracles. Luke, uh, Isaiah 61, Luke 4. He'd teach him parables. Psalm 78, Matthew 13. Be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. Psalm 41, Zechariah 11, verse 12, Matthew 26 and 27. Be arrested and have a false trial. Matthew, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 7, Matthew 26 to 27. He be condemned and buried. Isaiah 53 and Matthew 27. He died by crucifixion, having his hands and his feet pierced. Psalm 22 all the Gospels. His death as a sacrifice would happen uh, before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, according to Matthew chapter no, uh, Daniel chapter 9, where it says, Messiah shall be cut off, then the people of the prince to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the Messiah is going to die, then sometime later, another people will come and destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And he'd be resurrected, rise from the dead. Isaiah 53, verse 10, Psalm 16, and all the Gospels. Those are just some of the prophecies Jesus fulfilled, probably the most easy ones to recognize, but there are many others. And they're very specific. No one else could have done that. You can forget about Nostradamus. 
whatever Nostradamus said, which does make sense, he probably got from the Bible anyway. Uh, but his prophecies are very vague, and you have, can interpret them how you like. Bible prophecy is not like that. Either it's true or it's not true. And again, I've written a whole lot of defenses of these, which you'll find on the uh, Messiah Factor website, giving reasons why you can believe that the prophecies of the Messiah really were fulfilled by Jesus. And also, Jesus made prophecies of the last days, the subject we're interested in. Uh, again, things which he couldn't have made up if he were not inspired by the Holy Spirit, or the writers couldn't have made up. The things which are happening now. And Peter says this is a light shining in a dark place, which will help us to understand the difficult times we live in. That's why I believe we should study the prophecies of the second coming of Jesus, so that we can know what's happening now, and where it's heading to. And if you know this and understand it, then you've got to hope for the future. If you don't, then you're going to be like, what was that thing you said? The earth warning, earth warning us that we're going to blow up or something? Yeah. Whatever Philip, Philip was referring to in the newspaper. That, you know, there's a warning going out, and people are afraid of what's happening. They can see that there are danger signs for the future of humanity. Uh, what's the answer? The answer is that Jesus is coming. I'll be giving you a few of the specific signs of what's happening tonight in this month in prophecy and how it lines up with the prophetic word. But these are some of the general signs which will be happening. There'll be an increase in wars, famines, plagues and earthquakes leading to a time of great trouble on the earth. Number two, the earth will be full of violence as it was in the days of Noah. Many people will be afraid of what's going to happen. Three, there'll be great sexual immorality as in the days of Lot. Four, there'll be widespread pollution of the earth and problems with the environment. Isaiah 24, Revelation 8. Five, there'll be a restoration of Israel as a Jewish land. There'll be a conflict over Jerusalem, which will involve all the nations of the world. Can you see any of those things happening? Let's move on. Number six, there'll be a globalization process which will bring the nations together. Anti-Christian world government will arise out of this. Revelation 13 an increase in technology and travel, Daniel chapter 12. There'll be false prophets who will lead many people astray and cause confusion about God and salvation, Matthew 24, uh, Revelation 17. There'll be an attack on the basic truths of the Bible, opposition to those who teach the gospel, Matthew 24, 2 Timothy, 2 Peter chapter 2. And number 10, the message of the gospel will reach all nations despite opposition and persecution, the one which God wants us to be involved in. Do you see any of those things happening? Do you see all of them happening? If they're all happening, then you're living in the last days. That's why it's important that we know the prophetic word and why Peter said that the prophetic word is a light shining in the darkness and why the devil wants to put it out so that people don't know this and people are left in confusion not knowing where they're going, without hope. But if you believe this, then you have a hope for the future. Personally, I think that the world's going to go from bad to worse in the immediate future. That doesn't make me feel total despair because I believe that Jesus is going to come back and put it all right. And he's going to reign for a thousand years on the earth and bring peace and justice to the world as a prelude to the eternal state when we'll be with him forever in the new heavens and new earth. If you believe that, whatever happens out there, you've got to hope for the future. That's why Peter says it's a light shining in a dark place. So the prophetic word is given to us. And you can't know the, prof you can't know the future except by the inspiration of God. Uh, actually, there are no additions to the prophetic word which are being given today. There are interpretations of it. You can have words which are given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but there's going to be no addition to the word of God. Uh, if you go to Revelation chapter 22, is it? Yeah, last verse of the Bible, one of the, right at the end of the Bible. Revelation 22, it says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life from the holy city, from the things which are written in this book. You can't add anything to the word of God. 
You can interpret it, you can explain it, but you can't add to it. That's why there are no prophetic words, written words, which are going to come after the finishing of the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the New Testament of the Bible. That's why Muhammad's Quran is not right, why the Book of Mormon is not right, why all the interpretations of the Jehovah's Witnesses and others are not right, because they're adding to the Word of God. You can't do that. The Word of God is complete. As I said, you can interpret it, you can give understanding of things which perhaps have not been hidden for many years, but you can't add to it. And you should pay heed to it. Peter says, pay heed to the word as a light that shines in the dark. In Isaiah 60, there's a verse which says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Bible does say there will be a time of great darkness at the end of days, and that at that time of darkness, the Lord is going to arise on his people. Actually, this, in context, this is a prophecy concerning Israel. So that at the time of Israel's great distress and darkness, God is going to arise upon them and save them at the second coming of Jesus. But we can also see it as God arising on his people, the true believers in Jesus, uh, to give them the light of the word of God so that we can know what to say and what to do in the times in which we're living. And you're a privileged people because we have the word given to us and we can know it and believe it. And we should study it and understand what's coming. And we do need faith to believe this. So you need to have faith that the word is true. So these two things go together. Is the Bible true or is it a made-up story? If it's a made-up story, then you can forget it and go home and watch the football tonight and forget about all this. But if it's true, you have to pay attention to it. And you have to build your life upon the rock of faith in Jesus Christ. Very quickly, I'm not going to dwell on this because it would take too much time. I may give, come back to it later. In chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, he says that false teachers will come who will deny the Lord who bought them. Uh, know this, that there will also false prophets among the people. Even so, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. What does it mean to deny the Lord who bought you? How did the Lord buy you? He bought you by shedding his blood to redeem you. He paid the price. Uh, where did he pay the price? Where did he shed his blood at the cross? Peter's saying here that all the false prophets are going to some way deny the finished work of Christ on the cross, that Jesus died and he finished the work so that we can be redeemed through repentance and faith in Jesus. He gives you here a very simple test whereby you can pick out a false prophet. Uh, John gives you another one. In 1 John, he says that the false prophets and the false teachers are going to deny the relationship between the Father and the Son. So they deny that Jesus is the Son of God, also that he's come in the flesh, that he's also Son of Man. So if you see someone who denies the cross, who denies that Jesus is Son of God, and who denies that Jesus is Son of Man, then you're dealing with a false prophet. Think of any who have come since Jesus? Multitudes of them. In the next generation, and the next generation after Peter wrote this, is going to be a group of people called the Gnostics. I won't go into detail about what they believe, but it actually denied uh, the relationship of the Father and the Son. Uh, also, their writings denied that Jesus died on the cross. It says that uh, he was laughing at somebody else who was put on the cross who was, uh, took his place. You heard that idea? goes straight into the Quran. The Quran says exactly the same thing. So another indication where Muhammad or whoever wrote the Quran got his information from. Come to Muhammad, come to the Quran, what does it do? It denies that Jesus is the Son of God and it denies that he died on the cross and rose from the dead to pay for our sins. It's the spirit of Antichrist, it's a false prophet. Even Roman Catholicism, though Roman Catholics do believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead technically, They've added so much to it. Uh, the doctrine of the Mass in which Jesus is sacrificed over and over again in the bread and the wine uh, and in the idea that Mary becomes a kind of also add-on mediator or mediatrix to bring us to God. They've added to it so that the message actually becomes submerged and it becomes another false teaching. Say so nothing of Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, all the rest of them. Every single one of them in some way will deny the Lord who bought you. 
And Jesus warned that these false prophets are going to come and lead people astray. But if you look at this on the positive side, what he's saying is that you do believe in the Lord who bought you. You do believe in that Jesus shed his blood and redeemed you through his precious blood so that you can come to God. So he's telling you that this is the basic message which God wants you to believe. Now, Satan wants to distort this message and bring people into confusion, but there are, the truth is still there and it's still being preached and we can still believe it and have it eternal life. So finally, just to sum up three things that Peter tells us to do. One, to believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it's trustworthy, was given to us by eyewitnesses, uh, true witnesses of Jesus. Believe the prophetic word, believe it was given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that it's a light shining in the darkness to guide you in the way that you should go in your life. And recognize and reject false teachers, those who deny the Lord who bought you, but do believe in the Lord who bought you. Believe in the redemption which you have through faith in Jesus Christ. Do this and you can build your life on the rock and have security in the days that come. And coming back to where I started, if the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Believe all this. Trust in the Lord and do good. Wait for his coming. And in the meantime, use the time that remains to serve the Lord and to get his message out so that others can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. If you believe in Jesus, you're on the victory side. And uh, he is coming. <laughs> he has come in fulfillment of prophecy. He is coming to fulfill the rest of the prophecies. And he's going to bring peace and justice to the world, sling the devil out, and ultimately create new heavens and new earth where we're going to be forever with him. So believe in him. You've got a glorious future and a glorious hope. Praise the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Let's just have a word of prayer. We'll sing our final hymn. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you it was given to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through faithful men and women who are eyewitnesses to you and, Lord, who have told us both the things which have come and the things which are to come and that we can trust you for your word and we can trust you for our souls and believe in you and know that we have eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank you for this. Help us to do your will and to believe you. And if we have any areas of doubt or confusion, just help us to bring them to you and to seek you for further revelation and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.